Hello and welcome back everyone to Grockett's OG TV, the GMAT edition, where we're going through the official guide to the test, the 12th edition to the guide, like it says in the corner of the screen. Uh, hopefully you all have your books in front of you. Uh, we are in, well, I'd say we are over halfway through the critical reasoning section. There are, yeah, 124 questions in the critical reasoning section, and we're picking up with question number 89. So, as usual, uh, you will follow along in your book. I will read the questions so you know which one we're talking about. I will talk about um, what sorts of predictions I would make and that you could make based on the information in the passage, and then we go through the answer choices, even after we've gotten the correct one, because identifying wrong answer choices can be as helpful as, or almost as helpful as identifying the correct answer choice. Identifying the correct answer choice is still always the best thing to do, but uh, if you can get there by process of elimination, you still get the right answer. So like I said, we are on question number 89, and we'll just pick up there. Okay. Since it has become known that several of a bank's top executives have been buying shares in their own bank, the bank's depositors, who had been worried by rumors that the bank faced impending financial collapse, have been greatly relieved. They reason that, since top executives evidently have faith in the bank's financial soundness, those worrisome rumors must be false. Such reasoning might well be over-optimistic, however, since corporate executives have been known to buy shares in their own company in a calculated attempt to dispel negative rumors about the company's health. In the argument above, the two bold-faced portions play which of the following roles. Um, so one of the cues, uh, there are often uh, verbal cues as to what a given bit of, a, of an argument is doing in that argument. Words like thus, therefore, in conclusion, I guess in conclusion is two words, but uh, things like that can tell you that you're aiming for a conclusion. Words like since can actually tell you that you're headed for evidence because the, the, sen the, con the logical construction is since this, comma, conclusion. You know, since we know that uh, it's raining in the forecast, that rain is in the weather forecast, um, we've decided to bring an umbrella. Um, we've decided to bring an umbrella is kind of the conclusion. I guess that's not the most awesome one. I made that one up just now. But the since is clearly the, the evidence or the basis for the support for the second part of the sentence. And actually, in this particular case, um, both boldface portions of this argument um, are in sentences or clauses that begin with the word since. So both of them are um, evidence, bits of evidence or support for something else that happens. Now, we do need to determine whether they are things that the author agrees with or doesn't agree with. The first one, several of a bank's top executives have been, have been buying shares in their own bank, um, is support for the idea that um, it's, the, it's, it's support that some people use to decide that rumors about a bank are false. Wow, the top executives um, have been buying shares so that's um, so they must they must have faith in the the health of the bank. So the first bold face is support for the idea that it's evidence that a bank is healthy, I guess. Um, and the second one, corporate executives have been known to buy shares in their own company in a calculated attempt to dispel blah blah blah. Anyway, that second one is uh, support for what happens earlier in that same sentence where it says such reasoning might well be over optimistic however since so and you can read it in the reverse order since corporate executives blah 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 um, such reasoning might well be over optimistic so the second one supports a point that is contrary to the point that the first boldface thing is supporting okay so obviously as always it takes me far longer to explain it verbally than it would for you to analyze it uh, on your own time or even in a timed format like the actual GMAT. So, but we need something like that where the first, where the, they're both evidence and the first one and the second one are not supporting the same point. So choice A, the first describes evidence that has been taken as supporting a conclusion. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, the second gives a reason for questioning that support. Well, I mean, that, that sounds sort of like what we predicted, but um, one of the big things with these uh, boldface questions is that the way that you prephrase the structure of the um, argument um, 
very often they add a lot of extra words in describing um, what the roles of those things are and use different words for things like evidence. You know, evidence can be also support or reason. Um, you know, so uh, it's sometimes it's tricky to um, to sort out what it is they're actually saying. Um, let's just look at the other answer choices to see whether the other ones are more obviously wrong. Um, choice B, the first describes evidence that has been taken as supporting a conclusion. Yeah, that, that sounds right. The second states a contrary conclusion that is the main conclusion of the argument. No, so remember we decided that the second one was also some kind of evidence or support. It's not a conclusion on its own, so it's not B. Choice C, the first provides evidence in support of the main conclusion of the argument. The second states that conclusion. Well, the first one isn't really the main conclusion of the argument. Wait, I need that to be a minus. Uh -huh, oops. Um, so the first one is not evidence in support of the main conclusion, and the second one isn't a conclusion at all, so it can't be that. It's not C. Uh, D, the first describes the circumstance that the argument as a whole seeks to explain. Well, that's, that has potential because then we find out that there's two different reason, two different ways that you can interpret that. One, that it's a sign that the executives believe their firm is healthy. The other is that they are trying to dispel rumors and, and they know that it's unhealthy. So we could probably accept the first half of D. The second gives the explanation that the argument seeks to establish. Well, it's not actually trying to establish it, simply give it uh, an, alternate, an, an alternative thing. It's not saying that every time they do this, um, this is what's happening. It's saying that, that it might be that. Um, it says such reasoning might well be over-optimistic, which is not the same thing as saying that it is over-optimistic. So I have to vote down D because it's not... The argument is not trying to convince us of, of one thing, merely show us that there are two sides to the same bit of evidence. Choice E, the first describes the circumstance that the argument as a whole seeks to explain. Yeah, I, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, the second provides evidence in support of the explanation that the argument seeks to establish. And again, the argument isn't trying to establish one particular explanation, simply provide an alternative one. So it's not E either. Um, but at least the second one was evidence in choice E, whereas in choice D it was actually the explanation. Um, I guess they're, they're kind of similar. Anyway, that takes us back to choice A. The first describes evidence that has been taken in as supporting a conclusion, namely that, uh, that the, the firm is healthy, um, and the second gives a reason for questioning that support. That sounds pretty good, so choice A it is. We stay on our page, but we don't stay on our question. A new law gives ownership of patents, documents providing exclusive rights to make and sell an invention, to universities, not the government, when those patents result from government-sponsored university research. Administrators at Logos University plan to sell any patents they acquire to corporations in order to fund programs to improve undergraduate teaching. Which of the following, if true, would cast the most doubt on the viability of the college administrator's plan described above? So, of course, we always want to summarize <clears throat> the plan. So the plan is to sell patents for undergraduate money, basically. Money for undergraduate programming. So, to undermine, um, or, or to cast doubt on the viability, to undermine, to weaken, really, we're just being asked to weaken the plan or give a reason why it's unlikely to succeed. As always, when you're weakening uh, plans or forecasts, um, you basically need to undermine it on its own terms. There needs to be some element of this that needs to not work. Really, we have um, only two parts of it. We have the idea of being able to sell patents and then the idea of being able to use it for undergraduate programming. So uh, casting doubt on the viability of their plan basically is going to involve one of these two things. Either they're going to be unable to sell the patents, uh, if, it's, if you know, that answer choice is true, or they won't be able to use the money for undergraduate programming to improve undergraduate teaching. One of those two things, and we just need to look for that in the answer choices. So A. Profit-making corporations interested in developing products based on patents held by universities 
are likely to try to serve as exclusive sponsors of ongoing university research projects. That's completely irrelevant. It's outside the scope of the passage. It doesn't matter what the corporations want as long as they can still sell the patents. Um, so choice B, corporate sponsors, and, and also choice A, if they want to be exclusive sponsors, that's still more money for undergraduate you know, research, and so, yeah, anyway. Choice B, corporate sponsors of research in university facilities are entitled to tax credits under new federal tax code guidelines. So again, this whole corporate sponsors thing, we don't really care about corporate sponsors. We are interested in the selling of patents from government-sponsored research. So both of those are scope things. So I see research scientists at Logos University have, f have few or no teaching responsibilities and participate little, if at all, in the undergraduate programs in their field. True of many institutions, also outside the scope. The passage and the plan, you know, that they have, the university administrator, the college administrator's plan does not hinge on those research faculty doing the actual teaching or involvement in undergraduate programming, simply that the money generated by their, by the patents their research generates, that's what's going to improve the undergraduate program, not those faculty themselves. So it doesn't really matter that the research scientists um, aren't involved with undergrads because they don't have to be. Choice D, government-sponsored research conducted at Logos University for the most part duplicates research already completed by several profit-making corporations. So this directly addresses their ability to sell patents. If they have something that nobody's going to want to buy because they've already done that research, um, then they wouldn't be able to sell the patents and they wouldn't be able to use it for undergraduate stuff, junk, and things. So choice D, definitely tempting because it uh, weakens their ability to sell. And choice E, Logos University is unlikely to attract corporate sponsorship of its scientific research. Yeah, and again, we aren't interested in corporate sponsorship. So, I mean, you know, again, in the real world, corporate sponsorship is a huge deal in higher education. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of fighting over, you know, naming rights to buildings and sponsorship of programs, and um, but that's outside knowledge. Um, we really only care about the selling of patents acquired from government-sponsored uh, research. So choice E, outside the scope. Choice D is our correct answer. Page 513, question number 91. Last one on page 513. So this is an environmentalist talking. The commissioner of the Fish and Game Authority would have the public believe that increases in the number of marine fish caught demonstrate that this resource is no longer endangered. This is a specious argument, as unsound as it would be to assert that the ever-increasing rate at which rainforests are being cut down demonstrates a lack of danger to that resource. The real cause of the increased fish catch is a greater efficiency in using technologies that deplete resources. The environmentalist statements, if true, best support which of the following as a conclusion. So, you know, which of the following as a conclusion means it's an inference, which means there isn't a whole lot of predicting that we could do. Um, I mean, occasionally inference questions are structured at, you know, in the you know, evidence plus assumption equals conclusion, and you're just asked to make an inference from that. But sometimes they're just lists of, they're, they're slightly differently constructed passages, and you just need to find the answer choice that must be true based on what the passage says. Um, so there needs to be support for it in the passage, but it needs to not actually be stated in the passage. That's the difference between an inference and um, like a detail question from reading comprehension. So... Environmentalist statements, if true, best support which of the following conclusions. Can we conclude, A, the use of technology is the reason for the increasing encroachment of people on nature? Well, there, there isn't actually anything about the increasing encro encroachment of people on nature in the passage, so no support at all for, for choice A. Uh, choice B, it is possible to determine how many fish are in the sea in some way other than by catching fish. So, um... This one is potential. This one is potentially the right answer to a different question. Um, the environmentalist, environmentalist is not arguing uh, that the catching of fish is a harmful way of monitoring fish populations. Um, if the environmentalist were arguing that, this would be an assumption uh, in the argument or an inference that we could make. If the you know, 
if the environmental environmentalists were saying um, you should stop catching fish to count them um, this is terrible and it's wasting resources um, choice B would absolutely be an inference the environmentalists would be assuming um, or we could infer that it's possible to catch to count fish without catching them um, but that's not what the argument is about the argument is about um, the fact that more fish are caught says that there are more fish out there. That's the argument that the environmentalist is making. The, the environmentalist is saying, it's, you're not catching more fish because there are more fish out there. You're catching more fish because you're better at catching fish now, thanks to technology. So uh, choice B is not, does not actually support, or it's not an inference we can make on the argument the passage is actually making. So choice C, the proportion of marine fish that are caught is as high as the proportion of rainforest trees that are cut down each year. Yikes. Um, while the environmentalist does make an analogy to rainforests being cut down, there's nothing at all to suggest that the proportions are anything similar. So this is, you know, uh, slightly ridiculous, actually. Um, this one potentially would catch your eye if you were skimming. You just said, oh, wow, he mentions fish or she. It could be he or she. The environmentalist mentions fish and trees. Wow, therefore, the proportion is the same. That must be the inference. Um, and it's not. Totally not that. Choice D. Modern technologies waste resources by catching inedible fish. We don't find anything about inedible fish or about edible fish, so we can't make an inference based on this. The process of elimination tells us that choice E is the right one. Um, but uh, let's just see what it is, and then let's just see whether that's supported by the passage. So choice E says, marine fish continue to be an endangered resource. And this is one of those ones, very often inference questions, the correct answer will be such a small logical leap that it almost sounds too easy or too simple, um, something that the passage practically said anyway, and that's of course the key, that's what inferences are, things that the passage practically said anyway, but did not actually outright state. So the environmentalist is saying that the commissioner of the Fish and Game Authority says um, they've caught more marine fish and therefore the fish are no longer endangered. The environmentalist says that's crap, um, but doesn't actually go so far as saying the fish are actually still endangered, but certainly implies it by saying that that's a specious argument. Specious means... Um, attractive sounding but false um, so uh, so the environmental says that's specious um, and it's as unsound as saying that you know the rainforest thing um, so basically uh, directly discrediting trying to discredit the argument um, of the commissioner of the commissioner of the fish and game authority in doing so, so, and since that argument was that the fish are no longer endangered, we can infer that marine fish continue to be an endangered resource. So that's how we support the inference in choice E. And that's how we turn the page. You probably couldn't hear it, but I turned the page. You should too. We are now on page 514. All the cool kids are on page 514, and they are also preparing to hear about and read about Question number 92. In the country of Veltria, the past two years' broad economic recession has included a business downturn in the clothing trade, where sales are down by about 7% as compared to two years ago. Clothing wholesaler, wholesalers have found, however, that the proportion of credit extended to retailers that was paid off on time fell sharply in the first year of the recession, but returned to its pre-recession level in the second year. Which of the following, if true, most helps to explain the change between the first and the second year of the recession in the proportion of credit not paid off on time? So this is one of those ones. This is, this is a question with a GMAT gift where the argument that you need to deal with is restated as part of the question. We need to very specifically see why sales were down over two years. So over a two year period. Sales are down both years, 7% uh, over two years ago. But uh, credit-wise, um, they go from um, many not on time to more on time. 
despite sales continuing to be down. So sales are down f through this whole time period. Um, we need to explain why, even though sales continue to be down, more businesses have been making their credit payments on time. That's it. We have to explain it. So we need to find we need to find need to find an explanation for that, um, and it's proportion, not number. So. Choice A, the total amount of credit extended to retailers by clothing wholesalers increased between the first year of the recession and the second year. So it increased between the first year and the second year. The total amount, if they increase the total amount of credit, increasing the amount of credit available should not necessarily have an impact on the proportion that's being paid back on time if that makes sense. So just having more credit available doesn't mean that more or less is paid off or not paid off. It could be the same percentage, it could change. Um, so choice A doesn't really give us anything to go on in terms of an explanation for why sales would be down, but all of a sudden uh, businesses go to paying more on time. Choice B, um, between the first and second years of the recession, clothing retailers in Veltria saw many of their costs, rent and utilities in particular, increase. So this one looks tempting at first because we have costs changing. Um, and if costs went down over the two year period, that could explain why more businesses were able to pay back their credit on time. However, it actually says that costs increase. This is the reverse of what we need it to do. If anything, the relationship should have, be re reversed, should have been reversed. Um, if costs increased, we should have gone from more businesses paying their credit back on time to more businesses not paying their credit back on time because they're having financial difficulties. So choice B just makes it even more mysterious why more businesses are paying things back on time. So C. Of the considerable number of clothing retailers in Veltria who were having financial difficulties before the start of the recession, virtually all were forced to go out of business during its first year. Okay, so basically what this one says is uh, between point number one and point number two on our timeline, this is a timeline now, um, all the businesses that were having trouble went out of business. So in between here, we have a bunch of bankruptcies and closings. So basically, this would increase the proportion of businesses. And basically, all, all that's left are the businesses that are not having financial difficulties. And so they're making, so it's a higher proportion that are paying their credit back on time. All the ones that were having financial difficulties are basically completely gone. So the proportion has improved, even though the number of retailers has gone down because of all the ones that went bankrupt. So choice C definitely explains an increase in the proportion because all the naughty people, well, it's not naughty, but the ones who were having financial difficulties, all of them are out of the picture, or almost all of them, virtually all of them, to use the words from the passage. But let's look at the other answer choices. Choice D, clothing retailers in Veltria attempted to stimulate sales in the second year of the recession by discounting merchandise. Um, what they attempted to do is kind of irrelevant. If it had actually said that they stimulated sales by discounting merchandise and made uh, record profits, that would explain it, perhaps, because then there's more money coming in. But all it says is what they tried. And with no measure of success in it, choice D doesn't explain anything. Finally, choice E, relatively recession-proof segments of the clothing trade, such as work clothes, did not suffer any decrease in sales during the first year of the recession. Well, number one, it doesn't address the chronolo chronological shift between the first and the second year of the recession, so that makes choice E useless already. Um, second, you know, we find out that there is a recession-proof, that there are recession-proof segments of the clothing trade, but we don't find out how big those are or what impact that has on the... Um, the big picture. So really just finding out what happened in some small subsection for half of the recession does not address what happens between point one and point two. So choice E, completely irrelevant. Choice C, which gives us a reason the proportion would change, is absolutely the correct answer. So page 514, question number 93. 
Commentator says the theory of trade retaliation states that countries closed out of any other of of oh sorry countries closed out of any of another country's markets should close some of their own markets to the other country in order to pressure the other country to reopen its markets. If every country acted according to this theory, no country would trade with any other. The commentator's argument relies on which of the following assumptions. So the conclusion um, is that, um, so we have evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. Our conclusion is that if all did this, there'd be no trade. The evidence is the theory uh, of trade retaliation. So the assumption here, um, so this is basically a prediction um, that, you know, if everyone does this, um, there'd be no trade. And the way that you uh, identify, one of the key assumptions to any prediction um, is that that's what's actually going to happen. So the assumption is um, that this is, that people are basically going to uh, use the theory of trade retaliation. Okay, that, that, the, that uh, trade retaliation can happen. That's the assumption in the argument, because if it didn't happen, then this prediction would be false. So we need to find something that says that trade retaliation can't or won't happen. So choice A, no country actually acts according to the theory of trade retaliation. Well, that's pretty tempting, actually. Um, so let's, let's keep uh, choice A. We need, uh, so, because it fits in with the idea, um, well, actually, the, it's the, come to think of it, it's actually more the reverse, isn't it, of what we're after, because we need a reason that, tra that trade retaliation will happen, that we're trying to identify the, the assumption, not weaken the prediction. Um, choice A would weaken it, but it's at least along the lines of the assumption that co countries have to use trade retaliation. So, actually, I mean, we can pretty safely eliminate it, but... Anyway, choice B, no country should block any of its markets to foreign trade. What countries should and shouldn't do isn't in question. We are looking for the assumption in the argument. Choice C, trade disputes should be settled by international tribunal. Way outside the scope. Uh, choice D, for any two countries, at least one has some market closed to the other. So choice D provides the circumstances where trade retaliation can happen. Um, namely, they have markets closed to each other. So that sounds like the assumption in the argument. So we have the theory of trade retaliation, we have a circumstance where it could actually happen, and then the conclusion is, is if everyone does this, if everyone follows the theory, no one's going to trade with anybody. So choice D is pretty tempting. Choice E, countries close their markets to foreigners to protect domestic producers. Probably true, but outside the scope of the passage. So that leaves us only with choice D, providing um, the assumed circumstances that could allow the prediction to come true. I wanted originally I wanted to leave A open as a um, potentially, you know, one of the things I'm trying to model in the broadcast is what happens when you are. Um, doing a question and more than one answer kind of fits roughly what you're after and then how to eliminate the two. But midway in the process of keeping it uh, uh, open as an option, I realized, you know, this one isn't really as close as I would like it to be for modeling that type of, you know, that decision-making process when you have it narrowed down to two, so I eliminated it um, early. So sorry about the confusion. I just changed my broadcast strategy midstream. So anyway, choice D is the correct one. So, same number, different number. All right. Studies in restaurants show that the tips left by customers who pay their bill in cash tend to be larger when the bill is presented on a tray that bears a credit card logo. Consumer psychologists hypothesize that simply seeing a credit card logo makes many credit card holders willing to spend more because it reminds them that their spending power exceeds the cash they have immediately available. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the psychologist's interpretation of the studies? 
their interpretation. Um, so their interpretation, just to summarize, is that a credit card logo reminds credit card holders of credit. And that makes them more willing to spend cash because it's like, hey, I have, I have all this extra money I can spend. Um, so we need something to, to support the notion that the logo, credit card logo reminds credit card holders of the credit they have available. So choice A, the effect noted in the studies is not limited to patrons who have credit cards. So choice A actually weakens their interpretation because we, ne we need it to uh, remind credit card holders. If it actually also works of non-credit card holders, their hypothesis that it's reminding credit card holders about their credit probably can't be right. I mean, because then it, it's reminding non-credit card holders of credit they don't have. Anyway, choice A, totally not it. Uh, choice B, patrons who are under financial pressure from their credit card obligations tend to tip less when presented with a restaurant bill on a tray with a credit card logo than when the tray has no logo. Okay, so with this one, that's a, a long answer choice. Um, so it's saying that people who have credit card trouble see this logo and tip less, which is actually another form of credit card logo reminds credit card holders of credit. In this particular case, though, it's reminding credit card holders of their credit troubles, and they say, oh, I better not spend as much. So um, the hypothesis that it reminds credit card holders about their available credit um, is actually supported by this, although in the reverse direction. So we'll leave it as kind of a winky smile because we're not sure because it's kind of the reverse direction rather, rather than supporting this direct point. Uh, choice C, in virtually all of the cases in the studies, the patrons who paid bills in cash did not possess credit cards. That totally weakens it. The hypothesis is entirely about credit card holders. So nobody cares about non-credit card holders for the purposes of this passage. Choice D, in general, restaurant patrons who pay their bills in cash leave larger tips than those who pay by credit card. This is another one that weakens it. Because this just says, in general, if you pay in cash, you leave a bigger tip. Um, whereas their hypothesis is that they leave, left a bigger tip because they were reminded of credit. Whereas if it's just generally true of people who pay with cash, regardless of whether they have credit cards, that's not their hypothesis. And then choice E, the percentage of restaurant bills paid with a given brand of credit card increases when that credit card's logo is displayed on the tray with which the bill is presented. So this is potentially true, and this would strengthen a different type of argument, namely that uh, the credit card logo on the tray influences the consumer in some way, or that it influences their, their method of payment, uh, but it doesn't influence, it doesn't uh, strengthen the idea that it reminds credit card holders of their credit and causes and affects their tipping. So choice E, potentially the right answer to a different question, leaving us only with choice B, where even though it's the reverse direction, um, it still says that the credit card logo reminds credit card holders of credit and affects tipping. So the researchers or the psychologists, consumer psychologists argument is supported. Choice B. Let's see, 95. Although parapsychology is often considered a pseudoscience, it is in fact a genuine scientific enterprise. For it uses scientific methods, such as controlled experiments and statistical tests of clearly stated hypotheses to examine the questions it raises. The conclusion above is properly drawn if which of the following is assumed. Evidence plus assumption equals conclusion. The conclusion is um, that it... Uh, Parapsychology is genuine science. Um, and the evidence is that it uses scientific methods. 
So if the evidence is that it uses scientific methods um, and the conclusion is that therefore it's genuine science, the assumption has to be somehow linking scientific methods equal genuine science. Because that's the missing link between these two things. If it uses scientific methods and so again, the other way to think about it, one of the ways to think about assumptions is unstated evidence. If the argument had actually said what we have under E and what it says under A, the what we have under C would be an even clearer conclusion. So the fact that it uses scientific methods, and if you use scientific methods, you're a genuine science, therefore parapsychology is a genuine science. I mean, regardless of whether you agree with that, that's the structure of the argument. So we need to look for something that looks like this in our answer choices. So choice A, if a field of study can conclusively answer the questions it raises, then it is a genuine science. Uh, nope, we don't actually hear about uh, conclusively answering questions. Science itself, um, or you know, things more traditionally considered science itself, often does not conclusively answer the questions it raises. That's part of the point. Choice B, since parapsychology uses scientific methods, it will produce credible results. Credible, credible results are not part of the... Uh, the uh, passage at all, so that's not it. Choice C, any enterprise that does not use controlled experiments and statistical tests is not genuine science. Okay, so controlled experiments and statistical tests are in there. Those are the scientific methods. Um, not genuine science, so we have a link there. Let's keep uh, choice C. Um, choice D, any field of study that employs scientific methods is a genuine scientific enterprise. Okay, that has the two things too, the scientific methods and the, sci and the genuine science. So let's keep D. And then E, since parapsychology raises clearly statable questions, they can be tested in controlled experiments. Potentially true, but it doesn't address the issue of scientific methods or genuine science. So choice E does not give us the connection we need. We have the tough decision of choosing between C and D. Choice C says, any enterprise that does not use controlled experiments and statistical tests, aka scientific methods, is not genuine science. And choice D says any field of study that employs scientific methods is genuine science. So restated, C is uh, no scientific methods. not science. D is scientific methods equal science. And at first glance it, it might seem like these are both saying the same thing but as contrapositives of each other. Um, uh, but that's not actually strictly speaking true. Here, we need to differentiate. Now, of course, yes, choice D does look more like what I had written for the assumption, but just because I wrote it that way doesn't mean that it's uh, better. Um, we've had plenty of cases where that has turned out to not be true. Um, let's think about it instead. So they're trying to justify the idea that parapsychology is a genuine science because it uses scientific methods. That does point to the notion of D. Furthermore, choice C, if it does not use scientific methods, it's not science but it doesn't necessarily say um, what is science. If choice C is true, you could have something that is science. No, wait. Okay, so if it doesn't use scientific methods, it's not science. You could still have something that does use scientific methods, but is not science. All it says is um, that lack of scientific methods excludes something from being science. But it doesn't say that scientific methods make something science, whereas choice D says it does, and that is actually the justification, that's the assumption in the argument. So in this particular case, the way that I wrote it out in, in the equation here did matter, but uh, choice C does not automatically make parapsychology a science just because it uses scientific methods. All it, all it says is that it's not in the category of things that are definitely not science, which is not the same thing as saying that it is. So choice C 
doesn't quite get us there. Choice D is the direct link between the scientific methods of parapsychology and being genuine science. It's a tricky one. Uh, 515, page 515, question number 96. Hot co, oil, hot co oil burners designed to be used in asphalt plants are so efficient that Hot Co will sell one to the Clifton Asphalt Plant for no payment other than the cost savings between the total amount the asphalt plant actually paid for oil using its former burner during the last two years and the total amount it will pay for oil using the Hot Co burner during the next two years. On installation, the plant will make an estimated payment which will be adjusted after two years to equal the actual cost savings. Um, which of the following, if it occurred, would constitute a disadvantage for HOTCO of the plan described above? Again, let's summarize that plan. Um, their payment um, equals um, the total oil cost savings. So however much less um, the Clifton asphalt um, plant, however much less it spends on oil in, um, in the next two years um, over what it spent the first two years, that's what it's going to pay the Hotco um, company. So we need, to const we need to come up with a disadvantage, uh, probably a way that would reduce the total oil cost savings because this, if their payment is the total oil cost savings over the next two years, over the previous two years, the more that oil costs, the less they get paid. That would be a disadvantage. So we need something in the answer choices that makes oil costs go up. So choice A, another manufacturer's introduction to the market of a similarly efficient burner well, it's already installed in the Clifton asphalt plant, so it doesn't actually matter if a new one comes out. Um, they've already installed it, so and they've already got the money up front. Choice B: the Clifton asphalt plant need for the Clifton asphalt plants need for more than one new burner. If anything, that helps Hotco because for every one that they put in, they get this payment, you know, times number of burners. So they just make more money. Choice C, very poor efficiency in the Clifton Asphalt Plant's old burner. So if the old one was really inefficient, that simply creates a higher payment for Hotco. The more inefficient it was, the more that they'll save over the next two years using a Hotco oil burner, and the bigger the difference between the two total oil costs would be, and Hotco makes more money. So choice C actually would be an advantage. Actually, choice B is an advantage also because they make more money that way. Uh, choice D, a decrease in the demand for asphalt. At first, this sounds bad uh, because it means that they're not producing as much asphalt, but this still reduces the total oil cost for the Clifton asphalt plant in the next two years. Let's say they produce no asphalt at all. Then uh, the Clifton asphalt plant owes Hotco the entire cost of what they spent on oil for their first two years. So they owe the difference between these two years, here's where they install the thing, and these two years. So let's say this is, you know, a hundred dollars, we'll use small numbers, and this is zero, they owe the Hotco, um, these are our oil costs. If they go from a hundred dollars to spending zero money at all on oil, they owe Hotco a hundred dollars. So basically, the lower this number is, the more they owe Hotco. And that includes if asphalt demand goes down, they still owe Hotco more money because the difference between these two is bigger. So choice uh, D is also an advantage. Process of elimination gives us E, but we're expecting this to cause the cost of oil to go up in some way. Choice E says a steady increase in the price of oil beginning soon after the new burner is installed. Well, they didn't even give us a reason that oil cost goes up. They just say, hey, oil cost goes up. So the higher this number ends up being, you know, if this ends up being $1,000 in the next two years, Hotco isn't going to collect any money at all from uh, the Clifton Asphalt Plant. So that would be bad. Anyway, choice E is the correct answer.
um, 515, number 97. Delta Products Incorporated has recently switched at least partly from older technologies using fossil fuels to new technologies powered by electricity. This question has been, or the question has been raised whether it can be concluded that for a given level of output, Delta's operation now causes less fossil fuel to be consumed than it did formerly. The answer clearly is yes, since the amount of fossil fuel used to generate the electricity needed to power the new technologies is less than the amount needed to power the older technologies, provided level of output is held constant. In the argument above, the two bold-faced portions play which of the following roles. So, um, the first one, there's no uh, clue words, but it's just a statement that they switched. So the first one basically needs to be um, some kind of evidence or fact. You know, it's not a conclusion. Um, it's just a fact stated. The second one, um, it, the, the part that's not in bold kind of tells us what the second thing is. Um, it says, the question has been raised whether it can be concluded that for a given level of output, blah, blah, blah. So can the thing in bold be, can, can it be concluded? And then right after the bold part, it says, yes, it can be concluded. So basically the second bold face thing is a conclusion, is the argument's main conclusion. So we need to find that in the answer choices. So choice A, the first identifies the content of the conclusion of the argument. No, it doesn't, it's just some sort of evidence. Um, the second provides support for that conclusion. No, it was the conclusion. A is backwards. Uh, choice B, the, uh, the first provides support for the conclusion of the argument. Well, you know, it's a fact that's involved in making the conclusion, so I guess. Um, the second identifies the content of that conclusion. It definitely does that, but let's keep going. Uh, C, the first states the conclusion of the argument. Nope. Uh, the second calls that conclusion into question. Nope, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, choice D, the first provides support for the conclusion of the argument. Sure, okay. Uh, the second calls that conclusion into question. Definitely no. Uh, choice E, each provides support for the conclusion of the argument. Well, the first one does, the second one doesn't, so it's not E. So yeah, choice B, that the first one is support and the second one is the conclusion, is borne out in the answer choice and by the evidence that we determined. That's choice, or question number 97. Page 515, number 98. An experiment was done in which human subjects recognize a pattern within a matrix of abstract designs and then select another design that completes that pattern. The results of the experiment were surprising. The lowest expenditure of energy in neurons in the brain was found in those subjects who performed most successfully in the experiments. Which of the following hypotheses best accounts for the findings of the experiment? Those findings, which we need to summarize, are the people who were best at it um, spend less energy, where it was this abstract pattern thing. Okay, So we need to explain why those who were best at it spent less energy. Choice A, the neurons of the brain react less when a subject is trying to recognize patterns than when the subject is doing other kinds of reasoning. Other kinds of reasoning are outside the scope. We need a reason why the people best at this one particular task used less, en used, used less energy. Uh, choice B, those who perform best in the experiment experienced more satisfaction when working with abstract patterns than did those who performed less well. Satisfaction is outside the scope. We need energy, energy. Choice C, people who are better at abstract pattern recognition have more energy efficient neural connections. So this says people who are better at it have more efficiency, which would mean they use less energy. Choice C is pretty obviously the one we were after with the connection between being good at it and using less energy, but let's look at the other ones. Choice D, the energy expenditure of the subject's brains increases when a design that completes the initially recognized pattern is determined. This actually weakens or uh, provides an explanation why it's even weirder because the people who don't recognize the right pattern thing should be the ones using less energy. Because this says, when you see the right thing, energy goes up. So in theory, you know, or we can infer that those who would be best at this, the people who would most often recognize the correct pattern, or the correct piece of the puzzle or whatever, 
those people would be using the most energy because finding the right one uses the most energy. So it's actually the opposite of what we were after. And then E, the task of completing a given design is more capably performed by athletes whose energy expenditure is lower when they are at rest. Um, yeah, I mean, this doesn't necessarily explain why, the, because we don't know whether those who did this, I mean, none of them may have been athletes, and still the people who were best at it used less energy. So having this information about athletes, it's kind of outside knowledge, knowing that athletes have uh, kind of lower heart rates in general, their hearts aren't, aren't working as hard. Um, and that, of course, is different from brain energy anyway, so choice E is definitely outside the scope, leaving us only with choice C saying people better at this thing use less energy, which is basically what their finding said. Okay, two more. We have page 516, number 99. Which of the following most logically completes the argument? So we know we're going to have to logically complete the argument. Um, the irradiation of food kills bacteria and thus retards spoilage. However, it also lowers the nutritional value of many foods. For example, irradiation destroys a significant percentage of whatever vitamin B1 a food may contain. Proponents of irradiation point out that irradiation is no worse in this respect than cooking. However, this fact is either beside the point since much irradiated food is eaten raw, uh, or else misleading since blank. Okay, so um, what we have here in the final sentence of the argument or of the passage is um, a statement of two parts explaining why people who say that irradiation is the same as cooking uh, are wrong. And so one reason is that uh, irradiated food, much irradiated food is eaten raw, so it doesn't matter if it's the same as cooking, it wouldn't have been cooked anyway, so if you're irradiating it, you're taking away nutrients that wouldn't have been taken away otherwise. That's the part that's not the missing part. The other part is that it's misleading. So they're saying if irradiation is no worse than cooking, irradiation takes away the same amount of vitamin B1 as cooking. Why would that be misleading? Um, that you're no worse off irradiating than cooking. I think for this one, I don't know, personally, I think this is one that you have to just look at the answer choices. I, um, I don't know, I think this one's kind of hard. So we need a reason why it's misleading to say that irradiation and cooking are about the same thing, and therefore people shouldn't worry about irradiation. So A, many of the proponents of irradiation are food distributors who gain from foods having a longer shelf life. So it explains a motivation of theirs, but it doesn't really explain why that argument that cooking and irradiation, eh, what's the difference? Um, it doesn't explain why that's misleading. Choice B, um, is it misleading because it is clear that killing bacteria that may be present on food is not the only effect that radiation has? Well, actually, we've established that, and the irradiation fans have basically acknowledged this by saying, yeah, we know it, it destroys vitamin B1, for example, but that's no worse than cooking. So choice B is actually stated by the passage. It's not a anything misleading about the argument. Choice C, is it misleading because cooking is usually the final step in preparing food for consumption, whereas irradiation serves to ensure a longer shelf life for perishable foods. That's probably true, but it's basically irrelevant and probably we, everybody knew that. It's certainly not misleading because we're not talking about what stage the food is at or something like that. Uh, choice D, is it misleading because certain kinds of cooking are in fact even more destructive of vitamin B1 than carefully controlled irradiation is? Well, no, and, and if, if anything this would support the um, irradiator side of the argument, whereas we are arguing from the perspective of someone who thinks radiation treatment is bad for food. So um, that's not anything misleading about what the other people are saying. That leaves us only with choice E, which must be the correct one, but why? Is it misleading uh, since for food that is both irradiated and cooked, the reduction of vitamin B1 associated with either process individually is compounded? Okay. 
So since the people who are, who are pro-irradiation say, it doesn't matter if we irradiate it, it does the same thing that cooking would have done anyway. But that actually is worse if it's going to lose even more nutrients, if, if it's irradiated, loses some nutrients, and then it gets cooked and loses even more nutrients, the fact that it was irradiated caused a loss of nutrients that wasn't necessarily going to be there. So uh, choice E gives us a reason why it's misleading to say cooking and irradiation are about the same, have the same effect on food, because they don't when they're used together. Choice E. Okay, one more. Page 516, question 100. One way to judge the performance of a company is to compare it with other companies. This technique, commonly called benchmarking, permits the manager of a company to discover better industrial practices and can provide a justification for the adoption of good practices. Um, any of the following, if true, is a valid reason for benchmarking the performance of a company against companies with which it is not in competition rather than against competitors except. So this is an extra interesting uh, critical reasoning question because it actually gives part of the argument that, you, that isn't actually in the passage in the question itself. So the first paragraph describes what benchmarking is. The second part says all of these are good reasons to benchmark against um, non-competitors except. So we need the answer choice that gives a better reason to benchmark against competitors. Okay, so A, comparisons with competitors are most likely to focus on practices that the manager making the comparisons already employs. So this says, if you look at your competitors, they're probably doing the same thing. If you look at non-competitors, you might learn something new. This is a reason to benchmark against non-competitors and therefore is not the right answer. Uh, choice B, getting inside information about the unique practices of competitors is particularly difficult. Whereas, if it's not difficult to get it about non-competitors, you'll get more information that way. Another argument for benchmarking against non-competitors. Uh, choice C, since companies that compete with each other are likely to have comparable levels of efficiency, only benchmarking against non-competitors is likely to reveal practices that would aid in beating competitors. Another one in favor of benchmarking against non-competitors. Choice D, managers are generally more receptive to new ideas that they find outside their own industry. Another one in favor of non-competitors. Choice E gives us, the process of elimination tells us this is the right one. This one should be an argument for benchmarking against competitors rather than non-competitors. Much of the success of good companies is due to their adoption of practices that take advantage of the special circumstances of their products or markets. So this one is saying, you know, you get the most out of things that are particular to your industry, which implies competitors. We can infer that that would apply most specifically to your competitors in the industry. Therefore, choice E is the correct one. It's the only one that does not identify an advantage to benchmarking against non-competitors. Okay, we will stop there for the day. Um, my name is Jim Jacobson. You have been watching grocket.com. And this is the OGTV program where we go through the official guide to the test, that purple book that you've had in front of you for the duration of this uh, uh, broadcast. And we will pick up next time with question number 101 um, on page 516. And don't study too hard, and I hope to see you then.